Okay, good afternoon everyone. Thank you very much for coming to the book launch. Um, I'm Karina Fernley and I'm Diane Burr. We are both sort of the main editors of the book, so we've had to take the brunt of the work of producing the beast that you can see at the front here. Um, before we get started, just wanted to mention that this is actually being recorded and will be available online. So if you're not comfortable with that, then please don't ask any embarrassing questions. Um, but, um, <laughs> but you know, if you are comfortable, go for it. We are happy to answer any questions. So, um, <laughs> so, uh, so basically, welcome. Thank you very much for coming. Um, and uh, we um, anticipate there will be a lot of people watching this video online because many of our authors actually are living internationally and abroad and they've expressed an interest but obviously they can't just fly here for the afternoon. So um, so what we wanted to do was to just, um, we're going to give a little bit of a presentation to begin with just to provide a bit of an overview about how the book came about, um, talk a little bit about what the, the book actually provides in terms of content and then sharing some reflections on uh, crisis observations that we've seen in volcanoes. And of course, we'll then be having our panelists come up and asking them, we'll grilling them, uh, on, uh, um, on, um, on various questions and uh, hopefully getting some really good discussion going and then there'll be a Q&A at the end. So hopefully, um, by the time we get to six o'clock, you'll feel enormously enlightened about volcanic crisis communication and ready for some refreshments, which we've got in the other room. So first of all, I wanted to highlight why this book came about. And essentially when I did my PhD research, I was looking at volcano alert level systems in the United States uh, with the geological survey. Um, and I interviewed around 93 people. Most of those were USGS scientists. Quite a few of them were emergency managers. Some people worked in the media. Some people worked for forest services and all sorts of different commissions. Users of the alert level system, basically. And um, what became really apparent to me was that nearly everyone I spoke to had these amazing experiences that they'd had throughout their life of volcanic crises, but it was never written down. So, you know, I'd have this wonderful story by a seismologist who would tell me about this crisis they were working on in a different country, and of course all the seismological data or the geochemical data or the petrology data was all published in great journals, wonderful science, but there was actually nothing being written down about what happened in the crisis, what worked, how was the communication managed, and I just thought this was such a shame and this knowledge would all be lost in time um, as, as people retired, and it just wasn't being documented. So basically I thought what I needed to do was create a space for that material to be published, to, to start for it to be available for other people to read and learn from because if we're not writing these things down we can't learn them we can't analyze we can't move forward and so rather than it just being tacit knowledge in people's heads and just being shared at the odd conference or workshop i wanted to make it official so essentially um, this combined with what was becoming quite a, glo a global interest in volcanic crisis communication <coughs> Um, we've seen uh, in 1999 the professional conduct of scientists during the volcanic crisis that was headed by the IFC team and, and co-authored um, by Chris Newhall and that's since been updated um, by um, Guido who has also um, sort of starting to develop and pick these protocols and make them uh, more up to date. So there's some interest now about thinking about how do we communicate best in these kinds of volcanic crises. We've also had a number of different workshops. There's been the World Observatory, um, World Organization of Volcano Observatory uh, sponsored events that have looked at best practices. And there's been three of those workshops, um, two of which focused heavily on communication. And the second one was actually themed communicating volcano <coughs> hazards. So this brought scientists that work in volcano observatories all around the world to talk about how can we communicate volcano hazards better. And then finally, we've had a number of really big projects here in the UK and globally that have been involved in uh, looking at volcanic communication. We had Volco, which was an EU-funded project. And of course, we have the wonderful NERP ESRC Striva uh, project that Jenny um, was PI on and did some really, really wonderful um, communication, engagement. And of course, without that, we wouldn't have volcano top trumps, so, which is just the most amazing thing <laughs> ever. So um, really there was a real interest in an appetite in looking at uh, volcanic crises. 
So essentially what I thought was we need to bring this together. And so So was born observing the volcano world, volcanic crisis communication, which was, as I said, trying to bring together that wealth of undocumented knowledge so that we can get a better understanding of how volcanic crises work in practice. And as I said, it's not just about describing things, it's also about asking people to analyse and reflect about how those experiences were, what they can draw from it, what they can learn from it. And hopefully we can use that to improve, um, improve our volcanic crisis communication and management. So I sort of sat down one, well, I'll say one afternoon, probably several afternoons, and I basically wrote this dream team of what I wanted everyone to write on, all the different chapters, and who would be invited, and then I just um, invited them, and bizarrely most people accepted and wrote the chapters, and what was astonishing is that some of the chapters were written by people who had never even met before, but were working together, they never actually met together, but they were to talk about various issues that perhaps they'd never even thought of. I mean, one example is a, book, a chapter that looks at the communication for volcanic ash between Japan, Russia, and America. Very politically different countries, different bureaucratic systems and philosophies and ideas. And of course, they have to work together in this one issue to deal with all the cargo and passenger flights across the uh, Pacific, um, going over the Aleutian Islands and Russia, Kamchatka, and, and Japan. And so, you know, it was just astonishing that, you know, even when I sort of cold called people, they were so willing to, to write this chapter. So I like to think that there's some really interesting, unusual, quirky chapters there. And um, then, of course, I needed a, a team to deliver this. So I picked a <laughs> Diane, who's worked very closely with me during the six years of putting this book together. Um, other editors were Jill Jolly, um, Bill Maguire, and of course, Kat Haynes. Um, Bill will be here a bit later, but Kat is in Australia and uh, Jill is in New Zealand. So we were very lucky that we had such a, a diverse um, acceptance for the, for, the, for the book. We got over 100 authors and this was representing different people. So it wasn't just about the scientist perspective. We wanted to get emergency managers, civil protection, insurance, government officials, indigenous populations. So we've got some chapters written and contributed to, say, for example, like from Maori indigenous populations and telling their story of how they interpret volcanoes. We've also got um, chapters that look at teachers and educators and teaching and understanding communicating science from an educational perspective. Um, disaster practitioners, academics, and then a few other randoms throughout. So, um, so it's really trying to be um, as comprehensive as possible. I would love to have had more diversity, but um, you know this is just the start of the process. So hopefully next time, if there is a next time, uh, there will be more diversity. So what happened was we ended up after six years of book um, editing with this book that is 771 pages. Um, as exemplified here. So if you need a new do doorstep, this is definitely a, a good option. Um, and it's also available online. It's completely open access, which I'll come back to in a minute, and available as an e-book. So you don't have to carry that around with you everywhere. You can just download it on your phone or Kindle. Um, what we've been really astonished with is that the book's only been available online for about two months yeah. and most chapters have maybe been available online for maybe a year at most we've already had 105,000 downloads and it's going up by about a thousand every day so if you could just keep downloading that would be really good <laughs> and um, it's not us it's not us, <laughs> it's it's not not us um so we've had over 252 mentions and 23 external citations which is still pretty impressive given the short time. And I know all of you are thinking, well, what is the most downloaded chapter? Well, apparently, <laughs> the communication and risk management of volcanic ballistic hazards. There we go. <laughs> so um, everyone's in the ballistic mode at the moment. So um, obviously, you can uh, purchase the book for a bargain price of £44.99, which, as we know, for academic publications is actually probably not bad. But we do have some, some copies at the front here that are available for you to take away uh, today. So we also really want to thank our sponsors um, because our sponsors basically gave us the money that we needed to raise um, so that we could make this publication open access. I'm pretty sure we wouldn't have had so many downloads if the book was not free online and open access. And that's only made possible by the generosity of, of our sponsors here. And we have our representative from Bournemouth University who gave the Disaster Management Centre who gave us a very generous contribution to that. So thank you. Um, and everyone else, of course, who, who contributed 
We also want to thank uh, the team at Springer, uh, particularly Joanna Schwartz, who's had to deal with me emailing her for six years, <laughs> going, okay, when's the book coming out? When's the book coming out? When are we done? Um, uh, for, by all accounts, this is one of Springer's most challenging books that they've worked on in terms of the chapters being online first and then trying to compile it into a book. So it's been a real learning curve for both Springer and us, and I think they've been actually given everything, they've been really, really brilliant, and uh, they've been very tolerant of us as well, so uh, really want to thank those guys. So that's a bit of a background over the book. Um, now, the idea for the book was obviously about sharing experiences and perspectives, and from my research, what I wanted to do was to divide that up into sort of three main areas, three different ways of thinking about volcanic crisis communication. And the first one, which was kind of like a kind of a real revelation for me when we think about early warning systems and warning systems in particular, was that volcanoes, as, you, as many of you know, produce many different hazards, and each hazard produces its own different spatial, temporal um, di uh, dynamics. And basically, this makes it really difficult even just to manage a lahar on its own, let alone a lahar, an ash flow, and a pyroclastic flow, or lots of things happening at the same time. So it makes it very, very difficult. So what I wanted to do was just break it down and actually look at those individual hazards and say what are the characteristics of those individual hazards and what does that mean in terms of the types of communication that are possible and what are the challenges. So you can see we've got everything here from ash fall, ash and aviation, gases, hydrothermal features, um, uh, um, ballistics, which is the most downloaded chapter, and extreme volcanic risk. So how would we cope with a super volcano, for example? Um, and for all of our parts, we have a, a summary at the end. So if you didn't want to read all of them, you can just read the summary and get a gist of everything that came into that part. Um, we also have at the top there uh, a sort of introductory chapter, which um, outlines what the challenges and um, solutions are in the 21st century, which was co-written by Annie Winson, who's in the audience, uh, along with John Pallister and Bob Tilling, who are two very, very experienced USGS scientists that have worked in volcanic crises all around the world, particularly as part of the Volcanic Disaster Assistance Program. And so we kind of try to take stock there of where we're at with uh, warning and communication and kind of take a, a good snapshot of the history of volcanoes over the last 100 years and sort of tie that into something that's co coherent. So the second part is about observing volcano crisis. So this was really about getting people who've been involved in a particular crisis. So um, we have examples from Mammoth um, Mountain, for example. Um, Dave Hill, who works for the USGS, was one of the people that I interviewed. And um, he had this amazing story about Mammoth Lakes, the ski resort in, in America, and how there was this terrible balls up, basically, in terms of the USGS's warning and journalists finding out about it. And there was a lot of investment into the ski resort, which meant that when people found out there was actually not just a volcano, but also a sort of super volcano right underneath their investment, they were not very pleased, especially when it was showing signs of activity. So um, it became a real problem for the USGS and it created a lot of issues. Um, and this was just such an amazing story of the challenges that was faced, per personally and particularly by Dave Hill, who had to go there and work and restore the relationship with the local population. But just the remarkable recovery that he made from that and the great relations that, ship that, that exists now there between all the different stakeholders. And so this had been sort of written in a paper that was available in grey literature that wasn't available. So this was finally the opportunity to say, can you please write it down so that everybody can read it? And so this is one example of a number of different papers of crises like that where before we just didn't really have anything available to, to look at in terms of uh, the event. So we've got every lots of different countries from Mexico, Papua New Guinea, uh, Philippines, New Zealand, Ayafet Yokla in, in Iceland, Stromboli, Canary Islands, Mexico, Colombia. So we're trying to get around the world. We've even got some good examples in, in Cameroon there as well. So we tried to hit all the different continents and give some really good representative examples of folk who've observed a, a volcanic crisis and what, what it's meant for them. The final part was now thinking about, rather than the individual hazards and rather than the individual crises, 
was actually thinking about, well, what are the different elements of communication? And so we went through everything from thinking about historical ways of communicating about the volcanic crisis, to um, looking at reflections from indigenous populations, to working with local actors and communities, um, talking about cultural differences, um, to international collaborations, political problems, how do we make how do we have our decision making? How do we use statistics? How's insurance involved? Um, how do we deal with standardisation, which some of you know is, is kind of one of my research areas. Hazard maps, which has been a, a huge area of, of growth within uh, the volcano community over the last few years. Uh, GIS, technologies, remote sensing and so on, right through to educational aspects of teaching, um, engaging with local communities, local children to prepare them for volcanic crises, right through to social media. So it's really thinking about communication right from very old school oral traditions right through to up to date social networking. Um, and just thinking about all those different aspects and how they influence our volcanic crisis communication. So what I'm going to do is pass over to Diane who's going to summarise what the key findings have been based on the book. Thank you Karina. So, some of the key findings, looking at part one, uh, as Karina described, she went into uh, great efforts to try and get uh, representation from a whole range of different hazards and what the, the chapters in part one really highlight is that there's so much diversity in volcanic hazards and the impacts that they uh, can have on the surrounding communities and further afield. Because of this, a one-size-fits-all approach just does not work in terms of communication. We need to be cognizant of the, the uh, local nuances, uh, the differences in culture and knowledge around in the different communities that are impacted. It is important to have uh, overarching guiding principles. We need to be able to be speaking the same language, so it is important to have those principles, but within those principles we need to have flexibility so that we can take and capture the, the particular nuances with each of the communities that are impacted by volcanic hazards. As Karina described, for part two, there are a lot of lessons learned. So we've got a lot of uh, raw experiences, personal experiences of people who have worked in volcanic crises, other people who have had personal experiences in researching volcanic crises, uh, and from a professional perspective as well. There's a lot of different stakeholders that were involved. It, were, it wasn't just academic researchers that were involved in, in this project. There are a lot of different people. So we had some really good experiences documented in the various chapters in part two. And what came out of that is that in many instances, some lessons have been learnt the hard way. Um, but as Karina described in the example from Mammoth, yeah. it's, uh, you can rebuild those relationships. It takes time and effort, but they, it is possible to rebuild those relationships. Um, Communication uh, must be uh, done in an open uh, and transparent way. We need to be honest when we, when we communicate. Uh, and this way we will be able to build solid relationships and, and have successful outcomes through communication. Of course, there are politically uh, conflicting areas. There's difficult areas to work in, we all know that. And that's applicable to in, in anything that we do. But if we build on trusting relationships, then we will be able to communicate effectively. And of course, we need to be cognizant of the differing interests between different groups, particularly when we've got uh, competing scientific agendas. We need to be able to be open and transparent in our, in our own goals um, and be able to come up with a, a solution to move forward. One thing that I like about working in volcanology is that I do think the social and the physical sciences work very well together. There is, at times, uh, difficulties, but out of all of the, the natural hazard environments that I've worked in, I think that volcanology is probably the best in terms of working together. And a good example of that is this conference that we're recently at, Cities on Volcanoes. It brings together all of the different people working in volcanic environments. So overall, uh, the chapters from part two demonstrate that sharing knowledge and experience is vital to any new crisis, as long as this is done in a transparent, sensitive manner, and preferably prior to a crisis and with humility. So moving into part three, 
communication is all about trust and maintaining that trust at time at, at all times and that can be done if we ha have open honest and transparent communication between the stakeholders clear communication is dependent upon informed understanding of the nature of volcanic hazards risks and terminology and to be able to generate this informed understanding participatory approaches to this work very well and I think we'll hear a little bit more about that from Jenny uh, in relation to the Striva project and the amazing work that they've been doing. Of course we need to be professional but we also need to have a, a, a lot of patience particularly uh, because we are working with such diverse groups of people. It's very unique environments, uh, it's a huge diversity of people and we need to be able to have patience to be able to work uh, with each other in these, uh, in, during these events. And of course, evaluation is essential. We can't improve on what we know and what we're doing and the strategies that we are applying unless we evaluate them after every event, um, after every single workshop. We need to be able to reflect back on what we've done and, in, and build on those experiences and learnings to be able to move forward. Of course, social media has become very prominent. Um, we've been using social media for last eight, eight years it's been quite prominent in the uh, in crisis communication it, during volcanic crises and other crises as well. Uh, it is a very powerful tool but of course we know we need to be very careful with it as well in terms of misleading information. It's important uh, because of the ability to be able to share near real-time information uh, but it's also very important during times of quiescence. We need to be able to maintain that communication through social media to be able to still uh, generate awareness around volcanic hazards and the strategies that people need to implement to be able to prepare and respond during events. And of course, we need to recognise that it is a two-way tool. If we continually <coughs> just push information out one way, we will lose uh, the audience that we're targeting. We need to be able to ensure that it's two-way. But of course, it's not the only tool that we have, and we should not ever forget that. We need to still keep using all the other tools that we have. As highlighted in uh, part one, uh, overarching guidelines, international frameworks are very important, um, particularly when we're looking at global impacts like volcanic ash. Uh, but also what was highlighted in part one and has been uh, further highlighted in part three uh, is that it needs uh, the overarching guidelines and frameworks still need to be cognizant <coughs> of the local knowledge and culture and be flexible in that sense. So overall, uh, the chapters in part three, they demonstrate that collaborative, transdisciplinary and multi-organisational partnerships that include social scientists, health professionals, civil defence experts and community members alongside volcanologists are key to successful outcomes. So on that note, I would like to invite our collaborative, transdisciplinary and multi-organisational panel to make it up to the front and we will move into the panel discussion. an introductory, I would like to invite the panel, starting from the audience's right. Oh, that was <laughs> <laughs> yes, Chris, that is you. Just to uh, give a little introduction about yourself, where you work, what your interest is in the book, and volcanic crises. Fine. Um, my name is Christopher Pilgrim. I'm a physical volcanologist. Uh, well, not so physical anymore, of course, but the, um, um, I have a particular interest in uh, interpreting uh, precursors, the precursor signals, and working out uh, the potential of eruption of the volcano. And I've had experience in emergencies in, um, mainly in Italy, but also Caribbean and Africa. Um, I, just to highlight the book, I think one of the things that was, we found of interest in dealing with unrest is that 
making people believe that in your forecast or trusting it is as important as being able to make the forecast itself. And fundamentally, this is why this book um, is, represents a major step forward, in, as Karina and Diane were pointing out, and bringing a whole lot of information and expertise which normally isn't available anywhere else, bringing it into one place for the rest of us to learn from. Thank you. Richard? I'm Richard Breton, and in many ways I'm the outsider um, today. I'm an honorary research associate at Bristol University, and for 40 years until December last year, I was a lawyer. And um, in my mid-50s, some years ago, I decided that I didn't need to be a lawyer the whole time, went back to university and did a geology degree and subsequently a PhD. And my interest as a lawyer was in health and safety risks, mostly occupational. And uh, my belief is that the same principles of hazard identification and risk assessment in occupational risks um, Hazards are exactly the same as one would apply to natural hazards. And um, I'm obviously interested in the various roles that laws play in risk governance. And traditionally, they've created duty holders and duties, rights holders and rights, and then give people powers. And then, as we've seen from the L'Aquila trial in Italy, there are processes which people don't particularly like uh, of accountability and blame and sanctions. And the traditional role of the lawyer, um, described perhaps um, in its worst uh, way, is that of a vulture, in that there's already a dead body or someone who is injured, and then the lawyer picks over the pieces afterwards. And um, they're usually attempting to do various things. One is what happened. Two is what should have happened, and if there's a difference between the two, with a view to um, them seeing what the legal consequences are. So my research has been primarily involved in the quality standards of risk governance, and in particular the quality standards, if any, which um, currently exist in relation to hazard communications. Thank you. Jenny? Uh, so, my name is Jenny Barclay. I'm a professor of volcanology at the University of East Anglia. And um, my story that's kind of relevant to this book is that uh, I started out as a studier of rocks and thinking that you can understand everything about rocks and you can understand everything about volcanoes. But then, as a relatively junior scientist, you suddenly found yourself plunged into the darkness that is the dark of a pyroclastic flow and the ash associated with it. So we were in the ash and it was pitch dark and it wasn't well predicted by us. And there's just a sea of uncertainty and there were difficulties in communicating to the people. And that kind of unlocked an, a, an enduring interest in volcanic disaster risk reduction. And I've recently been uh, hosting a large project looking at some of these issues and communication is the thread that weaves disaster risk reduction, successful disaster risk reduction together. And so this book is a phenomenal achievement because what is written down here are some of the stories that you don't often hear in volcanology, but what they also are is some of the messages and lessons learned and there's just a huge amount of wisdom. So it's a phenomenal achievement to have alighted people's enthusiasm to tell those stories, but also to do it in such a systematic and um, wise way. Thank you, David. <laughs> I don't know how I beat that. Um, <laughs> so, um, your, Richard said he was the um, outsider. I'm the fraud in the. <laughs> um, so, my name is Richard Gordon. I'm the director of Bournemouth University Disaster Management Centre. We are a very strange group of people. We we sort of combine practitioners, academics, um, and hangers-on. And I think I'm one of the hangers-on. But the idea is to, to take disaster management to countries. And the reason why this book was so important to me was because it deals with a subject we've bumped into time and time again. It's crisis communication. And everybody has a, a view about it. Everybody thinks they can do it. Um, politicians are convinced they can do it. Decision makers assume they can do it. The experts that are brought to them um, are trying to help them to do it. But one of the things we discover in our work, and which is wonderfully illustrated in this book, 
is that the crisis communication starts long before the volcano erupts. It starts long before the disaster happens. It's actually right at the heart of governance. How do we communicate with communities? How do we communicate with people? Do they even believe or trust what we say? And in the period before a disaster, your experts are often different to the period during the disaster. And they will indeed conflict as to their agendas and the way that they frame what might, what might happen, what, what is likely to happen, and what the, the circumstances arising from that might be. So there's framing, there's meaning making, there's blame gaming, all these phrases we hear every single day as we run through Brexit. And these are happening right now before the volcano erupts. So communities, decision makers and experts themselves can become confused as to what is the clear crisis communication. It, love, it would be lovely if it were linear, that the expert informs the decision maker who authorizes the responder who tells people what to do. It isn't linear, because the experts are multifarious and disagree. The decision makers are at different levels and disagree, all have things to protect. And indeed, the communities themselves are, are culturally, ethnically, politically divided themselves. And then add on to that the international community. So huge complexity. This book is a fantastic beginning into that complexity. Thank you. Thank you. So we have a couple of questions for our panel. And the first question is, are volcanoes so different, challenging? Because there are so many different <coughs> hazards requiring different monitoring, communication, and response, spatially and temporally. And what are the key issues? You do have the questions in front of you, so I th just in case. Chris, this is the last time I'm going to pick on you to go first, but I think okay. we'll start with you. Did you mean the last time, the next question? <laughs> <laughs> Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Does anyone want to? Uh, uh, no, I think, uh, <laughs> I think it, lead, it adds complexity to already a, a difficult problem in the first place because it's, uh, I really come from a point where we look at um, volcanoes which have been reawakening after a long time of repose so that the public and nobody has seen the volcano in action. Um, not the public, not the authorities, not the scientists. And so there's, right from the very beginning, there's a lot of misunderstanding about what a volcano actually does. Mm. Um, and it can be based, let's say, primarily on, on Hollywood films, for example. Um, or it could be on, I went, to a I went to Hawaii, lucky person, and I see lava flows. And so they, they assume this mm. is how they are looking at it. Um, and so not only do you have to overcome get to cross the mist of actually what your volcano will do when it reawakens, you've also got to explain that actually it may not behave in a very similar way. It does. Um, that just simply adds to the complications of getting the message across because if you say one type of event is going to happen and another type of fact occurs, that you may be felt to have been wrong. In fact, actually, you're on a balance of probabilities. You expect one thing or something else to occur. Um, but in an emergency, some, this, these types of nuances are actually quite difficult to get across and indeed may not be the priority of action at the time of the emergency. And this, this goes back to the last point that was made that we, ought to, we need to prepare a lot of time before an emergency develops to actually mm. get the knowledge of the house. You see, you to prefer me to say yes. <laughs> <laughs> Someone else like to expand on that? Jenny? Yeah, so, I, so one of the things I think as volcanologists that we share with all the other hazards is we are completely incapable of forecasting both the timing and the impacts accurately. And so uncertainty is really important. And I kind of think volcanoes should be a great archetype because we do, there's a lot of talk at the moment about trying to do better with multi-hazards and we are the archetypal multi-hazards. So it's a challenge, but it's also an opportunity in terms of learning from other hazards, but also uh, moving and um, kind of conveying some of the huge amounts of knowledge books like this have within them that could be useful lessons um, for other hazards. 
I think something that's going to be really interesting in the next few years in this, in terms of key issues, is starting to think about time frames in a more constructive way. So thinking about them in the way that we do as volcanologists, because we've got to both understand changes on the way to the surface and then the potential hazards and then their impacts with a range of them, is actually starting to think about those time scales, not in terms of what we can do, but time scales in terms of how people around can respond and trying to match those. And I think that's going to be something that's going to be really interesting in the next few years. That that community that we've created where people are willing to talk about that boundary and that books like this create is somewhere where we can really start thinking about how to kind of merge those two things. So yeah. Thank you. Um, as a lawyer, I suppose I'm slightly concerned that um, we, uh, more and more people each year live on the sides of volcanoes and that the exposures, as a matter of population increase of Mark things, are bigger every year. And in a more perfect world, we would reduce the exposures and on the basis of the scientific information by long-term planning and planning development and land use. Well, I was in Naples um, two weeks ago with many other people here, and clearly that message hasn't been sold to Naples yet, <laughs> and that the population is two million, and by the time Campi Fagre or something else goes off, it will be even higher. So that is a, a considerable challenge, and I'm sure we could find examples throughout the world where, in fact, due to man's decision, the exposures are getting going up. And the vulnerabilities are not reducing because sometimes vulnerabilities can be related to building codes and the enforcement of building codes. But I'm told that in many parts of the world, one, there, is no, there aren't relevant building codes, and if there are, um, they're not enforced. And the, in relation to earthquakes, it's brought home to me at a conference where Jenny was last year, where the head of the civil protection in Portland said that after the recent earthquake there, they discovered that only 6% of the buildings not complied with their own building code. Well, that may be a reflection of the traditionally built buildings, but it does show uh, a, a failure which I rather thought could be mitigated. And the other thing that I picked up from my research is that as scientists have greater skills or perceive to have greater skills, then though at-risk communities may then de-skill themselves and they say, well, the scientists will save us and uh, we don't have to retain our traditional knowledge and it will be all right on the night. And I suspect that that's something that has to be addressed very um, seriously um, as well. Thank you. I, I agree entirely with the last speaker. Um, <laughs> And I think particularly of a phrase by a wonderful author called Terry Cannon, who wrote some amazing work, uh, one particular chapter on vulnerability analysis, where he just starts with a phrase, disasters are not natural. Uh, and I, I really sort of, picking up on Richard's idea, a lot of decisions are made as to where people live. Laws often do not underpin any form of the safety aspects of those decisions. Um, I've. I did some work a number of years ago to see how many countries actually have national disaster management plans. Now, we all know that there's the United Nations International Strategy for Disaster Reduction, that wonderful phrase that just springs off the tongue. Um, and of course, with 167 people who signed up to the Hyoga Framework, there's probably 167 nations that have got some form of risk reduction plan. But that wasn't the question we asked. The question we asked was how many countries have a disaster management plan, and that was a response plan a plan to actually respond, because there's no UN organization that checks to see if a nation has a response plan. We check to see if they've got risk reduction, and we, by default, check to see if they're doing something about um, recovery. But there's no country whatsoever, no um, agency whatsoever within the international community that checks to make sure that your country and my country has an international response plan to a natural or man-made disaster. And when we asked UN ISDR who they thought was responsible, they said OCHA. And OCHA said, no, we're responsible for international response, not the national response. And we think it's UN ICR. So it's sort of fallen in the middle somewhere. My answer to the question that we have here, you know, what's specifically difficult? I think one of the biggest difficulties is to have a single, united voice from the experts. 
Uh, Karina's asked me twice to speak to some of her students with a horrible title, Who's the Expert Anyway? <laughs> um, which, of course, the answer is us. Uh, no, we, it's a very difficult question because there are so many experts giving expert advice to different people at different areas and different levels of the pre-disaster, during disaster and post-disaster phases, I said earlier on. Having a single united voice is not easy. And I'll just finish with my, my sort of experience for Montserrat, where we were working with the Overseas Territories Directorate, and in particular with the Governor of Montserrat um, at that time. And he basically sent us a scientific and technical advisory committee report. And these reports are on a regular basis. And he said, I don't understand a word of it. And I'm meant to make decisions based upon this report. And the report is filled with provisos. And some might say this, some might say that. And you could think this, you could think that. How do you make a decision based upon that? Do we ask people to prepare to evacuate or do we ask them to stay? Having an expert who can provide advice to a decision maker in a united way so that the decision can not only inform but persuade and reassure. Those are the three, to me, the three components of any form of crisis communication. You inform, you persuade, you reassure. Can I just follow up? Um, yes. Sorry, 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 but you go to. You go. I was going to say, Richard's not going to agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, 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 no. Good. I, I wouldn't be so rude. Um, I was just going to add, uh, enforce that point, because uh, I, I give a lecture or two, and one of the questions I pose is, what's the most difficult question an advisor is ever asked? Whether it's legal, accountancy, Vulcan knowledge, what's the most difficult question an advisor has ever asked? The question, the answer to which is, I don't know. <laughs> there are so many uncertainties about volcanic hazards, then the, usually the answer is, I don't know. I was asked when I was a litigation lawyer, am I going to win the case? Those who train racehorses, is my horse going to win? We don't know, but the trouble is we never say, I don't know, because we want to be helpful, we're being paid, with, you know, they, someone's paid our salary, and we then come up with some longer narrative, and that's when we run into difficulty, because we use words they don't understand, probabilities they don't understand, terms we don't understand ourselves, and then we run into difficulties. I chuck that out as a provocation. So I, I think that one thing that's not been discussed in these two viewpoints, which are both very valuable and contain much that I agree with. That's, <laughs> I a polite glass of <laughs> that's the polite <laughs> bit. <laughs> um, is, is listening. And I think that one of the things that uh, underpins this book uh, and a lot of the chapters that are in it are, are the sense of actually listening and we've been doing exactly the opposite. I mean, because you've asked us to come and broadcast, but you know, so it's actually sitting down and thinking about what people want. And I think that's what I meant when I said that you know we can think through timescales in terms of timescales to make a decision versus timescales of when we feel comfortable about warning. And I think I think that's the conversation that we're going to have. And I think the thing that's really interesting about what you said is you used the word persuade which is what I thought Richard would be like, you have to be very careful about the advice. So just a complete confession here, I sit on the Scientific Advisory Committee of Montserrat just now and have done for the last few years. And uh, this issue of language, understandability, uh, uh, persuadability is absolutely key in these situations. And I think it, it, there are a very wide range of ways globally how people cope with it in the volcanological community and I think that's why your conclusion by bringing everything together is so powerful that yes there should be guidelines but they should be precisely that they should be guidelines and not rules um, because the really important component of communication is listening well, I agree I agree with that I mean an advisor at best gives a number of options so that informed decisions can be made by others without making the decisions for them. In other words, showing that number of people what's in the shop window, relative prices, relative merits, 
and then leaving it to the decision makers, who have lots of other things to take into consideration to make a choice, rather than saying, oh, you'll ni need the 99p1, shall I wrap it up? Which perhaps was the old traditional yeah. linear way of doing it. Oh, you like the 99p1, oh, I'll wrap it up for you, rather than saying, no, I've got 99p, oh, I'm thinking of five pounds. And it's that listing which is the, it's where we start rather than where we end. Absolutely. So, I, can I, yes. just to make the foursome here, yeah. I said written, the important thing to do is to listen, just, just so that I'm not making this up, <laughs> but it's written down here. Because, um, because again, um, one of the areas that we're looking at in Italy, it's quite clear that the approaches that are being taken are very top down. The, the, the scientists that sort of educate or try to, the authorities try to, they say, create a perfect plan. Um, and it's just assumed then that when something goes wrong, the public will do as they're told. Um, so let's have a look at that. The scientists often get the message muddled, got too much information using jargon that other people don't understand, so that's already been put down. The authorities um, perhaps don't properly take into account the fact that the public uh, aren't perfect and therefore when they implement the plans things don't go according uh, as the theory dictates and, and finally uh, the, the straight, forward, straight up truth is unless you've got trust the public aren't listening anyway and so um, it's really important not for them to listen but for us to listen to them to understand how we provide a message in a way that fits a little bit their worldview not just ours. But that applies not only to the public, it applies to the civil authorities, it applies to the scientists too. So when you do deliver a message, you may have to couch in slightly different terms according to who to whom you're speaking. But the only way you know how to do that is if you listen to their viewpoints first, mm -hmm. rather than go and tell them what to do. So in fact the key words have come up to listen to them, don't tell, to reassure perhaps rather than just to educate. Mm -hmm. And to motivate, I, I, I use that rather than persuade, no, no, rather than just to instruct. It's, it's, and I think, so clearly we're all thinking the same things. And we did not talk about this before. So. <laughs> Thank you. That was uh, quite a lively start to the question time. I think I might bring it back mm. to you, Richard, uh, because the Thank next you. question is on learning from past experiences. So you've just shared an experience from Montserrat uh, in terms of delivering where a report was delivered and wasn't understood and decision made, uh, decisions couldn't be made based on that. Have you got any experiences where things have been, where people have learnt from that experience and they've, they've applied those uh, learnings? Okay, uh, and I also need to make a confession. I was being deliberately provocative because in our chapter, what we were seeking to do was to show the issue of blame games. Mm. And in blame games, um, it's about how you frame what has happened. And what was lovely was that you framed it very, very differently to the way that I framed it. And that's where blame games happen. Because I will frame it maybe to say that my scientific experts misled me. And you frame it to say, actually, you never asked us. You didn't, or well, we didn't ask the people. And we can frame it to say, um, this was something, this was an act of God. This was an act of nature which completely overwhelmed our capacity. And you may say, actually, no, you're just incompetent. So we have framing and we have blame gaming that goes on, which is really where, where the heart of the chapter. Back to the question here. Um, are lessons learned? We have a, a trite saying, but we hang on to it. Lessons are identified. <laughs> to turn them from lessons identified to lessons learned, that's the clever bit. Uh, we've studied so many reports of humanitarian operations uh, which the UN have produced after Haiti, after Pakistan, the Kashmir earthquake, after a variety of international disasters. And we find that time and time again, it's the same lessons identified. One of them is talk to the people. Don't do it to the people, get the people involved. Pakistan had a classic situation where the impact assessments were written in um, the local language, but no one spoke the local language, so they were left in boxes, no one read them, because they only wanted to operate in English. So are the lessons are lessons identified? Yes, they are identified. Um, uh, and how do you turn a lesson identified into a lesson learned? I, I would say from a systems point of view, you need governments to own these things and actually to turn them into policy. 
And the policy then becomes something which is given to ministries and agencies and turned into training policy. And the training policy is turned into training methodology which is then implemented and then in, a, in an integrated way exercised and simulated. So we hopefully begin to filter this idea down. But I will also say that in our experience, a lot of countries refuse to identify what those lessons may be. They don't want the reports because of the blame that may come out. They don't want people to actually investigate because of the blame that may come out. And they withhold evidence because of the blame that may come out. Lessons are identified. They're very rarely turned into reality. I'll give you two examples of, of why. Um, and one, one where it did. So if you think back to the horrible incident of the um, football disaster where people were crushed to death. Um, and one of the lessons that were, was made out of that was we mustn't have people standing in Premier League Division football matches because the likelihood is they're going to crush them, crush them to death. In a horrible crowd incident, uh, that may happen. So what we need is people to sit down. That was the recommendation of the report. People need to sit in a Premier Division football match. Well, that's great, except you have f many, you know, fewer people going to turn up to these matches. So how are you going to overcome the need for money, ticket sales, with now fewer people coming along? And it was just a sheer fluke. It was just massive uh, fortune in timing that it was sat, sky, uh, sky and satellite TV that now comes into play. And suddenly it doesn't matter how many people are sat there watching the match because actually we're watching it on television all around the world, paying our subscriptions and so on. So we got around that. But almost after every single aircraft crash, people say it's safer, the reports will say that it's safer for you to fly backwards than it is forwards. In other words, the seats ought to be reversed. But no airline has ever wanted to do that because they're not convinced that their passengers will want to continue to fly with them. So lessons may be identified. Sometimes they're very difficult to implement because they're unpopular, they're expensive, um, or because the government actually just does not want to bring them into the into being. Jenny? Yeah, I, that, that's a fantastically powerful point about shifting from learning from past experiences to implementing change in response to them. Uh, one of the particular challenges, coming back to why volcanoes are so wonderful and special, is obviously that they tend to erupt on time frames that are longer than the average political lifetime. So you can kick problems down the pitch a little bit with volcanoes sometimes. Um, this book, I think, just, I almost feel like, it's really like sucking up to you both, but I feel like asking everyone to give you a round of applause for, for bringing together these stories that are not often written down, because it, it is a tremendous thing to have persuaded people to do that, because I completely agree with you that the, that the honesty and the openness in those past experiences is wonderful. So I think this book does really represent a huge step forward with that. Um, and uh, thinking the challenge, the, the, the baton that I think should be passed on to all of us as well, what do we do about that mm -hmm. now? And uh, one of the things um, that I was thinking might be kind of useful is taking a more systematic approach to learning those past lessons. So bringing in those relationships that people have built together, looking across from different perspectives. So this idea of blame, but without blame. And I think something that would be really amazing is actually to talk very widely and openly about failures. That's always a bit controversial, um, talking about failures, but kind of trying to see if we as a cosmological community can create some safe spaces to say what we really think. Uh, we were all involved in an early network of bringing together different types of academics. And it took a while even for us to say what we really thought, but that's where it feels like progress will come. So I think um, more systematic analysis, forensic type analyses, but also um, actually just creating a space where we can really talk about failure as much as we can talk about success, because that's a harder thing to do. And, and it, it's really wonderful that people have done that for your book. Yeah. And I think to, also from a government perspective, it's very difficult to talk about failure. Exactly. But it needs to be done. Yeah. Yeah. I, I suspect the word failure isn't a very helpful word. <laughs> Sorry, Richard. Well, no, I, 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 it's not my wise words. It's just, there's, there's a wonderful book called Failure by Stuart Farstein, which is a marvellous book where he thinks we should relish in things which didn't go right last time, rather than a failure. A failure is, well, you're a failure. It's pejorative. Whereas things that didn't go right last time is a much better 
way of doing it. I think it was Edison who said he kind of did it 999 times wrong, or not the right way, before he did it the right way. And he needed the 999. And what we've got to do as a community is to <coughs> encourage people openly to share the bit of the iceberg below the water from which we would benefit. When I did occupational uh, industrial claims, where did I look first for the history that would then predict the disaster? The first aid book. Because the first aid book will give you a thousand little incidences which didn't result in Joe going under the forklift truck, but might have predicted it. And therefore, I think we as a community must much celebrate things that didn't go right and use accountability, which I think is a very positive thing, in order to improve standards rather than criticise past uh, standards. When I was at my last role in my firm, which was a large international law firm, was compliance officer. <laughs> the job from hell. Um, and I said this to myself, we never ever really gain anything, benefit from the praise that we get when we get something right. We benefit most by our clients who give us the benefit of constructive criticism. And of course, a, a disaster, there is a lot of data which might be critical and we, we, need, to, we need to make the most of it and we must, must encourage people all over the world who are practicing communication, and many getting it right, many getting it wrong, to say, well, this was rather good, this worked, and this we tried, and it was an absolute stinker. Within our culture, it didn't work. It might work in yours. And, and therefore, I think we should be far more open about it's, it, what, what's it, what we, making the most of things which weren't perfect that time. Well, no, I was just thinking, I think, improve my CV now by listing all the grant proposals I failed with. So <laughs> <laughs> but, but, no, um, I, I must maybe take a slightly different view on this, this the, the, the question that said, are we learning from past experiences? And I, I want to make a distinction between learning as an individual and learning as a group, mm -hmm. because um, again, this is a particular case I had in mind. Um, the history was there was an evacuation without, an, the, 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 the volcano was arrest, there was an evacuation, no eruption occurred. But the evacuations were a complete mess because it was the first time in nearly 500 years that anything had happened. <coughs> then there was another sim uh, comparable emergency about a decade later, and it was much better organized simply because some of the people who had seen the mess the first time uh, actually understood and learned what not to do. So that's a, a classic example of learning from failure. However, since then, a whole new generation has now come to take uh, responsibility for should there be, at the same volcano, should there be another emergency. And not one of them has had any practical experience in addressing an emergency. They may have, they have learnt, and, and it's the same with all of us actually, we've learnt um, from um, other people's stories, we've learnt from papers, we've learnt from anecdotes what might happen, but actually when things go wrong in front of you, it's not quite the same as that it, it doesn't work like the book that you were reading that says what you should do next. And I'm sure um, uh, others in the panel here will have know this directly, particularly for example on right. When you actually talk to people, so someone comes and asks, um, asks you or, or groups of people um, don't behave in the way you expect, uh, you have to think on your feet, and that's not everybody perhaps is training in that. So it's more than just having um, learning about the volcanology and the hazard, but it's also learning how to react and respond during an emergency. And that's a very personal thing. Uh, not everybody has that capability. Um, and sometimes the best experts are the worst people to actually give the advice. And it, so I don't know if how, if the, I'm sure you have some particular stories you could, or well, maybe not uh, given the being filmed, they have, they have to be after them, but they have particular stories that can just reveal this. And I'm sure there are one or two that are hidden away in, uh, sorry, I didn't mean hidden away, that are uh, in, they're in, the, in the book too, so. Um, Thank you. Uh,
We might move on to question three, and I think we'll start with you, Jenny. Um, what seems to be the most effective communication based on your experiences? What is the state of the art? So, um, this is a really interesting question, uh, I think. Um, one of the first pieces of research in this area that I became interested in was communication methodologies, largely through um, Kat's PhD, obviously, in her work, looking at maps in particular. But something that uh, we've spent quite a bit of time thinking about and that I'm slightly bowled over by at the moment is the power of emotion, actually. is thinking about the role that uh, emotion, personal narrative can play. Chris was just alluding to that. And I think there's a really interesting tension um, to explore at the moment between the apparent cold, giving advice, responding, the governmental response, and then actually thinking about methods of communication and thinking about the ways in which people respond and in the end are motivated to think about it and place themselves in that situation of uncertainty. Um, emotion is an interesting one to start really start thinking about at the moment. And I'm very much um, t was struck again by the fact that you, you mentioned the word humility uh, quite a few times uh, it's come up really thinking about uh, us as placing ourselves in the role of expert and actually in participatory me methodologies it's quite difficult to break that down. It mm -hmm. all sounds awesome in the papers but actually that process of kind of uh, not being the one who's finally got a definitive answer and um, there's some fantastic stories about that. So I think humour and humility are incredibly powerful tools as well and that's something that I would like to see emerging into state of the art is actually starting to think about how we can respond to that without uh, frightening the horses in terms of very top-down approaches and thinking about bringing emotion into something that we're told has got to be emotionless. Um, I think it's a really powerful tool and I think technology driven uh, a lot of success with technology is as much about emotion as non-technological things too. So. Can I ask uh, just a, a question? Though. So, would you say that emotion, it, what we're really saying, is persuade? It's persuasion. It's well, that's interesting. That's emotion from a marketing perspective. I'm thinking about it in terms of uh, all of the challenges that we were talking about volcanologically. Uh, and as Chris says, there is there, there is not very little substitute for being in the moment itself, and that moment of chaos and uncertainty, um, and um, Emotion is a very good way to invoke how that is, but it's also a really good way to kind of understand people's participatory responses. It's all very well saying we're really interested in hearing these perspectives, but actually you don't have a God-given right to get them, you know, when you want them. So it's actually kind of, that's in a really useful way of kind of bringing out all the different perspectives too, I guess. So, so persuasion's part of it. Obviously it's always part of it, but... Um, yeah, I think I, I would go with motivation a little bit more for that. Mm. Did you want to comment well, on that? Well, I suppose the point I'm making, and it, it's, a, it's a very obvious point, is crisis communication in a volcanic eruption is about what you want people to do. And yeah. they want to know what to do. Which way do we run? Yeah. Do we run this way or that yeah. way? And yes, I, I would use emotion and, and everything possible to help and guide them. I mean, for me, the answer I, mean, I just wrote down was, whatever works best for the community. There is no single solution. The community knows the best way that it's going to be motivated emotionally or whatever way. Um, in Bangladesh, they use men on bicycles. Uh, that's the way they get the message around when there's going to be a major cyclone and there's going to be floods. Men on bicycles, that does it. Um, there's a, just some of the most extraordinary examples I've seen over the years. Yes, SMSs work. Um, you know, sirens, yeah. sirens can be switched off there. Yeah. And, and there's a horrible pol politics where one region suddenly finds that their sounds don't go off because they're on the wrong side of the government. But, but these, these, there are many. I, my answer to it is that it's whatever works best for the community, which comes back to listening to the community. How do we best activate you um, to do what we need to do? Chris? Yeah, well, I can um, maybe just a team bit to what's just been said, and, and because what I was thinking about that was uh, one of the best means of communication was actually to be physically present. Yeah. Um, at least to have representatives who are in the community so that 
when uh, messages are, are released, it's not from some faceless organisation that, um, for which you have no, well, I suppose, emotional attachment to, to some, to some degree or other. Um, and we have stories of previous emergencies where time again people interviewed and in certain cases particular names repeatedly, um, sorry, are, are, are repeated again and again. Um, well, it's repeating myself, I suppose. Um, uh, which shows that those people somehow were able to convey a sense of, author well, not authority, a sense of trust. People believed them. And that goes back to this point that the, it wasn't so much what they said, they were able to reassure the population that thing, that, that events, maybe rightly or wrongly, but it, 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 they would say events were under control. That's not to mean to say that everybody knew what was happening, it just means to say that there was no, the, the aim was to reduce levels of panic and random behaviour and actually um, show that there was a willingness to, to, to talk directly to, to the people. So, so I think physical presence is quite important here rather than the votes. Yeah. There's an interesting reflection there because we were talking about how oh, voking is so difficult, lots of hazards, blah, blah, blah. But one of the uh, real advantages we have is actually in that, in that quite often the volcano observatories and the monitoring scientists thinking about it from a scientific perspective are within the community in right. comparison so the earthquake scientists show up after it's like mm. a done deal um, only. So, well not only, but they're obvious and I think there's some really interesting comparisons to think about in there uh, in terms of you know the contrast and, and what what happens as a consequence of that. We certainly saw that with the uh, eruption of the Big Island mm -hmm. in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. Those, the, the people that were presenting at Cities on Volcanoes, they're part of that community. Yeah. It was impacting their own homes as well. So yeah. It's, yeah. yeah. There's a real kind of shared Sense of responsibility and shared experience there. Right <coughs> there. Yeah. 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 Um, I mentioned earlier that I am very interested in quality standards for communication. <laughs> and um, I, I, I don't want to get too kind of quality standards to be too formal, but clearly risk governance has a normative dimension and there are certain uh, legal expectations. And the minute we start using the word effective communication, I get concerned because what effect are we attempting by communications? It will obviously vary. Is it that we're trying to give a at-risk communities in a number of options from which they choose, <coughs> and not choose the ones that others would have adopted, or are we trying to change their behaviour? And I, I think that at the polar extreme, you know, there, there's a great difference between the two. And it can be best exemplified by a, a, an analogy. It's the difference between the wording on the box of painkillers, which you can buy from Boots, which give you all the kind of side effects, but it's kind of neutral as to whether you take the painkillers or not. And the box of cigarettes, which is very clear that we want you to give up smoking. And in our communications, is it very clear what we're we're trying to, mm. to do. And that leads me on to a uh, kind of uh, um, big moment during my um, research when I came across the social science theory which says that a, hazard commu a communication has no intrinsic value whatsoever, but it gains value from the sentiments and the actions of its users. Now, if, you, if that is the starting point, then we have to, we are told to think about the user community and the effect that our communication will have on them. Now, this may be scientifically beautiful, but if it's in English and the recipient is Russian, it's of absolutely no value whatsoever. And therefore, are there some hallmarks of communication um, that will enable this then to be have intrinsic value to be effective? And um, um, Jenny and many others have, for many years, have teased these out. And I would summarize them as 
is it material? In other words, is it relevant to the user community? If it isn't relevant, they won't read it. Is it easily, it, 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 can they receive it easily and on time? It, can they understand the words in it and then of greatest interest, do they trust it? Because you can get all the other three and just say, it's from the mayor who I think is politically corrupt and forget it. And I suspect that unless you get the, the, the ticks in all of four of those boxes, then the thing will have no or not the sufficient extrinsic value. And the importance, I suspect, of talking to the users, that the, the people living on the volcano, is to ensure that you do understand what will give your communication integrity and will be trusted when they want it, in what language, and how they're going to receive it. Now, very easily said, but the Spreva project and many others can dig down into the granular nature of how difficult it is in practice to get the four ticks and the boxes, but it always starts with knowing your users, which will, will vary from the airport authorities, very sophisticated now, to other people who have so many other hazards in their life, um, who um, have, uh, have totally different expectations, capacities and genders. Thank you. We might move into the closing questions and uh, thank you. I think we have touched on uh, this quite a bit throughout all the other questions, uh, but just in a closing comment, does maybe Richard, you haven't been first yet, I know you've just uh, had a good say. What I'm <laughs> saying is that I think that by sharing of experiences, things that didn't go right that time, things that went right, we will then develop within lo localities, regions, globally, good and bad, bad practice. From that, quality standards will emerge, perhaps under the headings of materiality, proximity, comprehensibility, and integrity. And that in, in time, um, there will then be a far greater e exchange of know-how from which we will um, all benefit. Someone else like to touch on the, the challenges moving forward into the 21st century? Yeah, but me, I don't. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> I'll, I'll, go, I'll do that. Um, Thank you. I, I always think of the little triangle where you have experts at one corner, decision makers at another corner, and responders at another corner. And right in the middle of that triangle are the community, the, effect, the, the people who are affected by this. And um, I think as we go forward, the point that I was trying to make earlier on, the experts, the people who are in this book and who are <coughs> writing these books, and the people who are going to read this book, I think we're going to find that the experts are more than just volcanologists. The people who need to read this book are people who are making decisions about where it's safe to invest. They're the people who are deciding where it's safe to live, where it's safe to build infrastructure, where to encourage tourism, where to encourage development how to provide early warning systems. This kind of expertise needs to read this, not just the scientific volcanic, volcanic um, community. Uh, when the crisis communications become something that's now, we are now having to start doing things, there's a different group of experts who need to have read this. The lessons that have been learned from the communities, the lessons that have been learned from what's worked and what hasn't worked, the, the total lack of clarity that's come in from political leaders, the, 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 um, the con conflict, indeed, between political ministries. For example, in, in, in one particular case, uh, you had on the same day two ministries sending out messages after a natural disaster. The first ministry was the Ministry of Tourism saying, please come back, we need your tourism, everything's lovely, please come back. On the same day, the Minister of the Interior is saying, we have been desperately hit by a natural disaster and we need your money. So which is it? You're okay and it's back to normal or you're not okay? So, and then even afterwards, the, 
we need to learn the, the experts that are going to need to dig into this book. And I mean experts, and I also mean uh, the people who are the responders, and I also mean the decision makers. All three of those, those triangle points need to get into this book. And when we get into the period after the disaster, well, what lessons have we learned? What lessons did they learn? Are we learning that all over again? Have we just repeated chapter seven uh, out of 43? Um, <laughs> why is that? Is that because of our political leaders didn't actually bother to do anything about it? We weren't listening to the scientific advice we were being given. So what I'm saying is the readership of this book is far, far greater than, than we probably realized when we started this evening. And that's because today's um, involvement in natural disasters as well as man-made disasters, we have so many different experts with so many different agendas. Uh, and one last final point from me, and, and I think even our ministries of tourism and our foreign offices who, who set up travel advisories, mm -hmm. that's a very, very powerful thing mm -hmm. because they see something happen and immediately put up a travel advisory. And it's, but they don't listen to the scientific community to know when to take it down again. Mm -hmm. And so countries are screaming at them, but it's safe. They're saying, no, it's not until we think it's safe. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh, on a similar note, before I forget it, I think it's, un, it, it's just not possible in future for a post facto di disaster inquiry for this book not to be in that court. Yeah. Yeah. This, I suspect, will become the first kind of Bible of standards. And I can see advocates say, well, so and so, so and so happened. Now, if you'd read this, have you read it? Why didn't you? If you read it, why didn't you consider so and so? Why didn't you learn the lessons from so? So I think that, you know, without kind of overselling, this book will be used a lot as the go-to, the current go-to place for for how to do it and how not to do it and, and lessons this, to be learned. And this was the motivation that Karina had to put this book together. So. <laughs> well, it will it will be there, or it should. Yes. It should be there, and that's perhaps the greatest compliment you can pay to the editors of it. Certainly Thank heightens you. the threat of having the book thrown at you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jenny, oh yes, Chris. Jenny, was there any other areas that you think need particular focus? Um, so I would just agree uh, with both of the other two about um, situating ourselves. Uh, with a little bit more humility in the context of other hazards and challenges that people face. So this is great, um, I think kind of looking outwards and thinking about where we sit as a natural corollary. But I want to just very quickly share the thing that keeps me awake at night uh, in terms of some of the, uh, the types of research that I do in the more participatory vein where it, I passionately believe that you should be involved in the communities that only top-down approaches are, that's where the failures quite often lie. But with volcanoes and volcanology, there is the very difficult fact that there is often volcanic eruptions that are outside the lived experience of communities around them or the volcanoes can change. And thinking really carefully, I think a really interesting challenge is bringing the two approaches together, of course, but thinking really carefully about how we communicate and deal with that in crisis management, the change during the course of the crisis. It's not just a moment like a hurricane, it can be weeks and months. So that makes me worry sometimes. Yeah, so solve that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Jenny. We started with you, Chris. We will finish with oh, you. Good. No, well, anyway, I, I just want to perhaps end up slightly less frightening notes. Um, <laughs> and, and that was that actually the reason why we Volcanoes are not inherently a threat in as much as people live around them because there are huge benefits too. And I think we have to, we have to put, put in context that it's only for a short period of volcanoes lifetime that actually poses a direct threat. And in the intervals in between, it, it, it <coughs> delivers a lot for us, whether it's agriculture, quality of life, many, many other aspects. And if there were a way in which we could put yeah. The crisis is just being part and parcel of this is, you know, we decided to live here, we've got all these benefits, but every now and again, mm -hmm. and we might be the unlucky ones, things may not work out as we expect. And you see hints of this at frequently erupting volcanoes, um, mm -hmm. I can imagine Vesuvius in its, its recent times, where um, parts of the volcano were threatened and the population's just accommodated it. I mean, 
of course they were frightened at the time, but it was understood that these things would happen and then just go back and, and life then continues on afterwards. And so I think if we can actually make crises seem <coughs> normal rather than dramatic, that could also be a step forward in, in actually reducing the, the, the levels of, sort of perhaps unnecessary fear that is behind it, especially if we don't have experience of these things. Very true. We, uh, some of the research that I've done with Guthrie Gisladora, we were working with residents who had lived for generations around the Katla volcano and one of the residents said to us, we know that Katla, she will come and visit us one day, but then she will leave again, mm -hmm. So, it, and everything will be okay. And on that note, I would like to, for you to give a quick thank you to the panel, but please stay here. And I'll pass over to Karina. Okay, so we've heard um, what the panels, uh, panel members have very uh, generously uh, said in terms of their, I've told them to be as open as they possibly could in terms of their viewpoints, just go for it. Um, but I guess it'd be also interesting to see and just review what the summary of the book was. Like what, what, what did we as editors feel was the main messages that were coming out of the book? And it'd be interesting just to compare that. So um, we kind of started by saying we've only really scratched the surface in terms of volcanic crisis communication. There's a lot more to do. And I mean, even in this panel discussion, I'll be going over the video and making lots of notes, because actually there's lots of themes for volume 2, 3, 4, 5, That's and right. 6 of this book, I think. Um, it's really just the start of it. <laughs> <laughs> so my career is now just this book, basically. Um, there are so many more stories to, that remain to be documented, and that actually these future trends and future ideas are constantly changing, because of course society, technology, culture, politics is so dynamic, it's just constantly changing. But we kind of came up with three key things that we felt were important from the book. And really the first thing we thought was that there needs to be more data. And of course when you go to a sort of volcanology conference, there's a lot of, we need more data, if we have more data we can understand the volcano better. But actually we need more data. We need more data about how volcanoes are um, understood by different communities around the world. Um, and to document those. And as, as came out from the discussion, both the positive and the negative, the successes and the failures, all the things that we could have done better, you know. So we need to then just not just describe that, which is in itself a very important process, just describing it and getting it written down, but also to analyse those and look at those successes and failures and think about um, what might be suitable to adapt into different contexts. And be cognizant of those contexts also changing over time and the need to come back and review them over time. The second major point that we thought was to really build on that narrative so that, that many of the stories that were told in this, this book, moving from the descriptive to the comparative and analytical. And of course, you can't do that if you don't have the descriptive to begin with, which is kind of where this book starts with. I mean, we asked the authors to think analytically, but a lot of the times it is very descriptive, a personal narrative about what happened. And we need that to be able to start to analyse. If we don't have that in the first place, we can't start to sort of look at the trends and compare, look at those lessons uh, learned or identified. So we need to continue to um, review the crisis that we're involved in. We need to make a space for people to talk about them, to feel safe about reviewing what things worked and didn't work. And that's really where the gains can happen. And those are a number of things that came up in, in the panel discussion as well. And that's, so it's bringing the practice and the theory together. And that's where we can actually make the most gains. Um, and we can learn one from the other, from the theoretical and the practice. And then I think the third part, which I think you know, really was very emergent from the book, was this idea of continuous feedback and engagement, which is critical in this field of, of research between many, many different stakeholders. And, and the need to um, engage and, and get to know people on a personal level. These are really, really big decisions. Being asked to leave your home and not knowing if you're ever going to come back to your house, whether your house is going to be destroyed, whether your community will ever be the same, is a, a huge thing. And you've got to have trust, and that trust has to be developed by having relationships with people. You know, if you know, if you know Bob because you've met Bob, Bob's at the back there, and you, you trust what he says, you know, good lad, you've been out, perhaps had a, had a drink, or you've had a meal, or gone to a couple of meetings, that makes a huge difference when Bob says, actually, guys, it's time to go now. It really, it's just very, very simple. And, you know, when we're dealing with these very, very complex crises, simplicity is often 
the best way of negotiating our way through them. So um, we think that this book um, is important um, not just for the academic community, but we also think we want these stories to be shared with the broader audience, which is why we're so grateful to our sponsors as to why this was open access. Um, and what we want to do is to hope that finally, in a way, the volcano community, along with other natural hazard communities, can value the story of the crisis. And yes, it's a story and sometimes very personal, but it has a lot of uh, value in it. And we need to value those stories and provide a space for that. And not just any old space, you know, we need to also create a valid academic space for academics to publish in so that there's credibility, it's peer reviewed, it's not just someone's opinion, and there needs to be some kind of a rigour to them. And so it's, it's very important that we value those stories. So, um, so basically, um, what I'd like to do now is kind of just ask if anyone's got any other questions that they want to ask uh, either Dan, myself, or the panel uh, for five minutes or so, and then we shall wrap up and we can discuss further over a glass of wine. You shouldn't have said that, no one's going to ask any yeah, questions. Yeah, sorry, yeah, sorry, yeah, <laughs> There's no one. Has no. <laughs> anyone got any questions? Yes, Julian. I, I was reading on one of your screens that there, there was a phrase, population growth in hazardous areas. I first read as growth in hazardous areas. So How are we on top of identifying hazardous areas? Or is that still very much an open question? Volcanologically. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we so volcanoes have the advantage of being sticky up and pointy uh, associated with <laughs> tectonic shift. I'm going to pop the exam if I can. No, no. So we have, sorry, we have, we have identified most of the world's volcanoes. Do we have clarity on which of the volcanoes that have erupted in the past are likely to erupt again? No. Our high percentage of volcanoes of the world monitored on the ground so we can pick up early signs in the subsurface of activity. No, there's I think only about a third that have mm -hmm. monitoring equipment down. So there's there's gradations in our level of knowledge uh, uh, in terms of awareness of the hazard. So the range of activities we don't we know less about, but we, we know where they are. Uh, but we're once it gets beyond that, we get less good. Is that fair? Yeah. Yeah, and of course you can get new volcanoes forming. Yeah. And so some of the crises that have been experienced in Alaska and Japan, yeah. and the Canaries have just been a completely new volcano that's just popped up. So that's um, it's difficult when there's new hazard areas emerging in locations that you weren't expecting, yeah. which makes it difficult. I'd just add too that um, if you think back to the Icelandic volcanic eruption, a lot of people discover that they were vulnerable yeah. to hazards, that mm. particular hazard in a way they never thought before. The airline industry, for a start. Um, uh, surgery on the east coast of Australia ceased during that period. Uh, lack of blood being transported across from Europe. So there are other cascading knock-on effects, if you like, from volcanic eruptions, which make us vulnerable in ways we didn't know before. This came home to me a few years ago as a, a volcanic unrest simulation exercise in Tenerife. And there was a, in the modelling, there was a pyroclastic flow, very limited uh, <coughs> uh, spatially, um, but it took out the desalination part. Mm. And within about 10 minutes, we were past the primary hazard of the volcano. We were talking about running out of um, drinkable water within two or three days in the height of the tourist season, having to get in by boat because the airport was closed. Mm -hmm and uncontrolled forest fires, which yeah. may be a, 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 a go great, get greater importance with global warming. So it's this horrible mixture of primary uh, and uh, secondary hazards. And I suppose the other point is that if we're not monitoring the hazard, it would be ambitious to think that we were in any way managing the exposures or the vulnerabilities because we haven't got past base one. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Beatrice? I would like to add to the, you were talking about volcanoes and, and the desire of people to live close mm -hmm. to volcanoes, which is a fact. It's often a very fertile area. But in comparison to other houses, like climate change and so on, the, that might not be 
a, a total disaster to live close to a volcano. And to some of our people that we've been talking to in hazardous communities in Iceland, people who know the risk of living there, they know the history of the volcanic activity through centuries. But one of our, our interviewees, she told us that I would rather like to live close to my volcano yeah. than live in Reykjavik and be constantly uh, exposed to traffic hazards yeah. and in other areas where people are dealing with uh, pollution and everything. Yeah. It led to other, other kinds of things. So I've been reading your papers lately uh, because uh, <laughs> I've been looking at non-compliance with evacuation, so just mm. the motivations. And globally, uh, the one thing that comes up in almost every location, so regardless of degree of development or whatever, is sense of place and mm -hmm. attachment to the, the attachment to the volcano, but also attachment to the community and the sense of community around that volcano. And I think that kind of relates to the not sleeping at night, because my view with that is, well, that's something that we should encourage and we should work with it as a resource, but then how do we cope with, you know, effectively, to some extent, the corollary to what people are saying is we would like to be in an area where there's a possibility of death in the event of a slightly larger eruption. Mm -hmm. Whose who's choice, which is maybe well, where you can spark up, up whose choice is well, that? Well, that's the point I'm making, is that yeah. we're saying that we should give people informed choices, and they yeah. will then make yeah. choices. You know, um, my one of my supervisors, Ryan and Chris, did work on Cotopaxi, and you know, they said, this is an active volcano, you should be worried. I'm worried more about losing my yeah. job, my daughter being raped, being mugged in keto and blah -de blah -de blah So don't tell me that this mm -hmm. volcano should frighten me, because it hasn't frightened my ancestors for umpteen um, years. And I, I think we've got to th think very carefully about what we're trying to do by communication. And we've also got to put on the other side the human rights as well. And it may be a human right to, in an informed way, live in very dangerous places yeah. and from one to every eight generations be killed. And you know, another way of putting it, is it rational for the two million people in Naples to be still living there? And I would say, very rational. Is there a recording? <laughs> No, uh, well, no, I think it is, because the city's been there for 2,000 years, it's been through numerous eruptions, and it still survives. So from that point of view, as far as the city is, uh, 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 of Naples goes, it's been quite safe. It's true that before it was founded, there were pyroclastic flows that went right through where the city now is, but clearly that's an event that occurs every few thousand years. So taken on that time scale, it's, it's a perfectly good place to be, and with all the benefits that it has. Um, I was going to say, oh, I've forgotten now because you distracted me from oh, the paper. Sorry, <laughs> so you looked at me and I distracted Oh, no, I know, it was. <laughs> no, it, I, I was just wondering whether some of this, there's a difference between raising awareness or, or, or hazard in the long term or when actually there's clear evidence that something may be about to happen, when you sort of move yeah. from general hazard to an emergency. Because I wonder also if this is a, and I was really going to put the question back to Gudrun, is it? Mm -hmm. Yes. The, is that it's all very well for people to say, yes, I've lived on this volcano, my, my parents did, my grandparents, my great-grandparents, grandparents did, and nothing happened, so I feel at one. But of course, when you actually see the thing erupt and the possible, whatever it is, love for a paracast or something, coming down to white, mm -hmm. that's not really, I don't think you are informed, because I don't think the concept of, well, we can stay here, but actually within two minutes we might all be dead, not just me, I mean, that the family and friends and everything. I just wonder if that idea really has got through. Because if you haven't been through it, or haven't seen it, or haven't been directly yeah. affected by it, I think you might have a slightly romanticised notion of this. And this keeps coming up in yeah. history. Mm -hmm. I think the famous case, sorry, was Mount, one of the most, was Mount St. Helens in 1980, when Harry Truman said, oh, I'm the man of the mountain, and I can stay here, I understand the mountain. And he was the first one to be killed. 
well, you know, maybe that was his choice. I just wonder whether anybody says, all right, Harry, you can stay here, but tomorrow you will die. I bet you he wasn't phrased in that sort of way, because he may have had a slightly different uh, 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 outlook here. Yeah. Well, so I, think, I, think, I think none of us in the room can understand the complex psychosocial trauma that would be caught, being caught up in a volcanic eruption uh, or, or seeing your relatives die. And I think that, I think that is what I worry about, is that the, the inevitable is, is, to, is to try and work with that. But I think that's not a bad thing to worry about and it's an interesting and useful challenge, I guess, that trying to think about, trying to think about that. And it, what we do know is globally it's responded to in very, in very different I suppose if you pose that question, then you're beginning to find the answer, and yeah. it is talking to communities and building up this integrity factor, yeah. so that they they trust you enough to say, look, I know, in the words of Timothy, you felt lucky for the last eight centuries, but I really think now you should be prioritising this hazard against all the other things that keep you awake at night. What was it actually? Are you feeling that? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> May I respond to Richard? No, Chris. Yeah. yeah, it's alright. Yeah. They're all Richards. <laughs> because I think sometimes the local community, there is so much knowledge yeah. in the local community. Even they might even know the, the local environment better than the volcanologists. Mm -hmm. So the volcanologists, they may, may have have predicted that there would be, let's say, a volcanic outburst flood, but they don't, they might not have the uh, long-term experience of how the, how the flood will yeah. behave, yeah. but that might be embedded in the local community. So I think the scientists or those who make the emergency plans, they need to take advantage of the knowledge of the society. So it must be a, a, a communication both ways. Yeah. Not only that the scientists need to yeah. the... Of course, but equally I would say that you, you may have the floods or whatever natural events that occurs, and in the past people survived, but actually things have changed and should have happened again, they're all being wiped out. And I think I mean, we, you have to have this exchange of views, yeah. absolutely, this is quite clear. But I, I, I somehow feel so, there are sometimes these romanticized views that we have lived here for so long we understand it better. Well, no, if you haven't been through it, I don't think you'll understand it at all. And I think this is true of everything. It's nothing to do with volcanoes in particular. It can be uh, whether you take the fire insurance in your house. Well, there hasn't been a fire here for the last hundred years. No. But as soon as one happens, you might wish, you know, you put the safety doors in and that, you know, it, it, so I think, that, think there's a lot of, it's, it's more complicated than just one side or the other, it's a mixture of views. Yeah. You would, I mean, you would say it's romanticised, but I think that's because quite often as a scientific community, we kind of alight on the most cutesy version of the stories in some ways, and, and, and more often than not, it is about obviously an attachment to place but that's profoundly tied in, in many volcanic contexts to livelihood and you know how people make a living and I, I mean I would I would strongly agree with what you said about community knowledge we found within the Strever project that by listening to how people were adapting and working with these we understood things about the scientific processes there were gaps in our knowledge in terms of how we were monitoring them. it comes back to this idea of the eruptions you have to forecast them coming up to the ground but also think about the impacts and the impacts and the response are, are where there's such a huge depth of knowledge but I, I think what we need to do is try not move too close to the romanticized the kind of cute anecdotal stories and actually think about community knowledge in a much course. broader way yeah, right. and the, the wider okay. point is that we've got to get away from knowledge creation, construction, and then knowledge, communication. And in fact, they're not two separate processes in some linear model, that they're very much integrated. And that while when we're listening uh, to uh, the at-risk communities, it's not only in order to communicate well with them, but it's also the actual knowledge, the creation of the knowledge that we will communicate. And I think that's a very, very different way of 
looking at things. So I think we'll wrap it up at that point because actually I think that kind of ties in very nicely with what you know that so we sort of agreed to put in the end of the preface which was really the, the whole point of the book was kind of dedicated to those that had lost their lives in volcanic eruptions and the hope that this book will ultimately lead to a reduction in the loss of lives going forward because of the learning that we can get from this and I'd just like to very much uh, once again thank the panel for coming here today and contributing um, their thoughts. It's been really, really useful. Uh, again, I'd like to thank our, our sponsors and Springer for, for being so supportive in this rather big, complicated book. I'd like to thank our 100 plus authors who have just been amazing in terms of writing the chapters and pulling it all together. I'd also like to say a huge thank you to my co editors who've trawled through several iterations of many many chapters over six years to pull this together and listen to me nag for six years literally um and so um thank you very much to all of those people but i'd like to just we could just give a round of applause again to, to everyone today. the book we want to get to 500,000 downloads <laughs> <laughs> we want to be on the front page of Springer uh, links there also you've got some handouts with links and QR uh, links as well but we'd love for you to um, go we've got a room next door which has got a reception I'll come back to you in a minute Chris Chris got something to say uh, reception with some nibbles and a glass of wine so please you know it'd be lovely just to have a little chat and discussion afterwards enjoy uh, the refreshments and also we have a number of books available so um, Springer actually published the book uh, slightly prematurely, um, so, um, so um, there are these books that are available for you to take for free. Uh, basically, the only thing, the content is absolutely correct apart from the front matter, so the preface and the sort of table of contents is wrong, but absolutely everything else in it is as it is online. So pretty much if you're interested in the chapters, which is the most interesting part, then, uh, then everything's fine. So please help yourself to that version. We've just put a sticker on here so people don't think that that is the actual final version. Of course, you can get the real final version online. And as well, we have 100 copies, so yeah. please help yourself yeah, yeah. <laughs> to multiple yeah. copies. It's Christmas presents for colleagues. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's we there. don't want to have to carry them back to the office. Yeah, yeah, please do. <laughs> Thank you. So oh, just, Chris, just, yeah. just before we leave, we've heard a lot of thanks, but maybe the final thanks should go to the two. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 So thank you all the other editors. <laughs> yeah. 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 Thank you, thanks, Bill. Thanks, Jill. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Good, good. All right. And these are the good friends. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. We'll go grab one more.